Welcome back to Sacred Council is a podcast where two former pastors kids dish about life, deconstruction, relationships, sex, love, and all other sacred things. I'm Brian Recker, a former evangelical pastor. And I'm Meg Holiday, a former pastor's wife. <laughs> we're not licensed therapists. But we're just two people sharing our journey and wrestling alongside of you with the big questions of spiritual evolution and all the messiness that goes along with it. Uh, we actually recorded the first episode of the season just a few hours ago, and we decided, hey, we had some time in the afternoon. We wanted to dive back in for episode two while some of these thoughts were fresh because we felt like our conversation had legs and maybe had other places that it wanted to go. Meg, what were you on about? We had to interrupt because she had to jump off on a call, but she was going off. She wanted to go off on the Trump Bible. Well, I'm definitely excited about the Trump Bible, but I felt like there were about five topics we needed to touch on and we didn't have time in the first episode. <laughs> My main question is how many Trump Bibles did you buy for yourself and your loved ones? Oh, I mean, I immediately purchased one for myself, one for my kid, one for my girlfriend. And then I assumed my immediate family has already purchased theirs. So that wasn't necessary to get to get extra. I will does does your family do they sleep soundly on my pillow pillows? Do you know? Are they are they in on the my pillows? Oh my god, I I barely know about that, but I'm I'm gonna go ahead and say I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. Republican pillows? They don't have the Republican pillows. <laughs> I don't know, but my dad has a mega hat, and they definitely have given money to the Trump campaign in the past. And there is like a Trump, you know, like magnets on the fridge at their home in Florida. So I definitely know that there's memorabilia um, invested in. I'm sure that they are on the Bible train. I just threw away my my pillow slippers. I did not throw them away because of some sort of ideological, like I can't dare to have these conservative slippers. No, I threw them away because I wore them almost every day for two years and they fell apart. They were actually pretty fucking comfortable. My parents got me my pillow slippers a couple of years ago for Christmas. They've also gotten me a pillow. Um, and you know what? I'll, I, I, I'm an ecumenical guy. I'll, I'll use a pillow regardless of how it votes. <laughs> I can't, I can't believe that not only did you own those items, but you are like a fan of them. That's amazing. No, no I, I mean, I would never buy them. I would never go out of my way, but I'm not going to, I was given a gift by my parents and the reality is I needed slippers and yeah. I, I miss them. I need, I need more slippers now. Those are in tatters. So apparently poorly made actually. <laughs> Mike Lindell or whatever his name is, um, but they were comfortable. They had a nice little plushness to them. The right. pillows themselves are kind of trashy, but anyway, that's enough about that. Trump Bible. Yeah. He's peddling Bibles now. $60 uh, a pop. And I'm wondering how this differs. Maybe you can help me understand pastor Brian, how this differs from the money changers in the temple. I feel like Jesus might be throwing over some tables. I'll, I'll tell you how it's different. Okay. It's funnier. <laughs> yes. I don't I don't want Trump to stop this sort of behavior because I personally find it very entertaining. Um, I found it very funny when he said two Corinthians. Um, I found it very funny. Actually, this is like sad, but like I don't I forget. It was like um it's like during the height of the Black Lives Matter protesting. And like there was like tear gas being like shot in front of the Capitol and like Trump was just there like holding a Bible like this, like just stiff woodenly, just yeah. holding it up. He didn't have it opened. He was just showing it off like we're 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 tear gassing the protesters as this good book commands us to do. Almost yeah. like it was justification for their, you know, sort of police brutality or right. you know, whatever what was happening. Just the Bible like in case you're wondering what's going on here, this is what's going on. It's Bible. We're doing Bible stuff. Yeah, it's Bible. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the the crazy thing is, even though like wordlessly, you just kind of held up that Bible, it made sense to Christians. A lot of American evangelical Christians are like, yeah, no, that checks out. That's what we're here for. Um, yeah. Law and order, the Bible, that's what that means. It's, And that is just, I, I think the thing with white nationalism, it's just, um, it's co-opting a majority culture religion. And it could yeah. be any religion. I think this is what religion can always do. It's just taking the majority culture religion and using it to keep people in line to, you know, enforce your cultural proclivities. Yes. Um, That's right. Yeah. I, I which takes us into the Christian nationalism thing, because I, I know we wanted to talk about Driscoll for a minute 
too. And we didn't get to do that earlier, but he, he, um, what did he do? He, what did okay. He, what, yeah. yeah. Okay. We didn't, we didn't talk about Mark Driscoll in the last episode. I don't think so. Okay, this is fresh. So my, Mark Driscoll, uh, responded to one of my videos about hell yesterday. <laughs> L- last night, I was delighted to see, um, somebody shared with me a reel that Mark Driscoll posted, which, you know, he's like kind of somberly sitting like over a picture yeah. of me talking. So I, I do my whole spiel about hell and he really let me rant. Actually, it's kind of a, it was a poor, I have to just give him some points, some notes, just critiques. It was a poorly done reel. Just so like for your social media team, Mark, as someone who's, you know, built a little bit of a social media thing over here, I have notes for you. Don't let the guy you're critiquing talk that long. Like he let me go for like a minute and then he had like 20 seconds. Like all his like, followers were following you all of a sudden because they're like, this guy has something good to say. He didn't refute my points at all. I, I, the reel that I he chose to respond to was about, I was talking about the institutional pressure that's on pastors to believe in hell, even though I don't feel like it's a well-supported biblical doctrine. I think there, there's scant biblical evidence for hell. Mm-hmm. And the reason that hell, you might say, oh, if it's not in the Bible, why does everybody still believe it? There was a ton of institutional pressure. And also the theology that has been derived in terms of how we view salvation, what the whole point of Christianity is, has really been built around the existence of hell. And so you can't just, it's like a Jenga tower, right? Like you can't, it's its one of those precarious pieces where if you pull that out, it might all fall down. So the system has to protect itself. And so hell has to stay in, in the system. And so I was pointing that out in this video that, the 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 whole idea of hell it's more institutional pressure than what's actually in the bible that's keeping this thing in place he doesn't respond to any of that he's just like if there is a hell then this guy sure is in trouble and like just does some kind of fear mongering no, stuff that's not what he really said that was his response exact- for like well thought out argument i mean i that was not a quote but that was the general idea that was the spirit of the of the wording <laughs> and so i was delighted to see that because it did feel like a full circle moment because I was at one point in my life, I was a Mark Driscoll fanboy. Right. Um, right. He was kind of the it pastor amongst young, white, emerging sort of potential Christian leaders that were looking for something cooler, somebody more interesting to listen to than yeah. just, you know, the old guys in suits because right. Driscoll would wear, well, this was what is this like circa 2004 maybe when I discovered Driscoll and so Driscoll had his you know boot cut jeans and he had a lot of like affliction sort of like bracelets on you know like affliction tees and like the the chunky buckle you know buckle bracelets like that you get the store named buckle where you can get the affliction gear it all comes (laughs) I think that's where he shopped probably He would talk about drinking beer and smoking cigars, and he would say like a cuss word every now and then, but he ultimately had the same fundamentalist theology that I was raised with, which it, what Driscoll did for me, which was important for me at the time, was he gave me permission to break out of the visual mold and some of the cultural molds of the fundamentalism that I was raised with while still being able to hold on to the theology. In other words, I wouldn't feel like I was a compromiser of the scripture, but I could at least look cooler and not be a total dork. That was like the permission that Driscoll gave me. What which is wasn't... his association with, with Rob Bell? What's so, oh no, to, okay, this is confusing. Rob Bell led Mars Hill Church in Michigan. Mark Driscoll led Mars Hill Church in Seattle, Washington. And they're not affiliated. Two separate churches, not affiliated at all. Me. That's but, so confusing to me because Rob Bell, I was a huge fan of. And that's a whole other, that's a whole, like he, Rob Bell wrote a bunch of good books, Velvet Elvis, uh, Love Wins. Yeah. And it was yeah. around the same time that Driscoll was very popular. They were both in evangelicalism, but they were kind of beginning to approach things from different ways where Driscoll was like, I want to have the cool vibes. Like his church had great music, like Mm -hmm. uh, Mars Hill in Seattle was known for like this very grungy alt rock music that they were doing. But ultimately they had conservative Calvinist theology. Um, Rob Bell was evangelical, but was beginning to push into more progressive territory. And then ultimately he wrote Love Wins and Embraced Universalism and was like kind of kicked out of evangelicalism after that. That's right. I know that Rob Bell is definitely considered a heretic heretic in mainstream evangelicalism. Yeah. The interesting thing with Driscoll was as I watched, you know, because I was a fan of his, like I said, when I was like, you know, 19 years old. 
And I was, I was, again, I was raised fundamentalist. So anything that was like not fundamentalist, I was like pushing the boundaries. The fact that he said, damn, from the pulpit, like a couple of times, I was just like, oh my gosh, like that is so cool. Like you're just groundbreaking over here. Yeah. Um, Such a boundary pusher. <laughs> right. It's kind of silly in retrospect, but it meant a lot to me at the time. But yeah. then what came out over the years was that he was just incredibly heavy handed and abusive. Yeah. Um, he grew... Um, and, and you can check out the the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Have you listened to that, Meg? Wait, or is that a podcast then, or is it yes. a like yes. series? Oh, okay, no. Rise I and fall of Mars Hill is a podcast about Mark Driscoll growing Mars Hill into this behemoth that it was, and then it collapsed almost overnight because of his leadership failures. His own pastoral team basically asked him to kind of take a leave of absence and and they wanted him to stay but to kind of take some disciplinary time to like work on himself and he was just basically like fuck this i'm out of here i quit fuck you guys he didn't say that but that was basically the spirit of it he left he did not do any disciplinary process he just left and eventually started another church and so when that happened, he kind of shifted and like main because tr Christianity today produced the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Um, and so mainstream evangelicalism kind of said, oh, he's a bad actor because he did he did a lot of leadership abuses. But Christianity today is actually viewed as progressive by a bunch of like white nationalist Christians, which is wild. Um, I know there's magazine like the publication company. Is that what you're saying? evangelicalism in America is very strange and complicated. So like the rise and fall of Mars Hill, if you listen to it, a lot of people have been DMing me about it because they're like, oh, you got to tell people about this. And I haven't really pushed it. And the reason is it's an evangelical podcast. And ultimately here's the, it's a good podcast because they really do interview a lot of people that were hurt by Mark Driscoll and you get an inside scoop into like leadership abuses in the mega church. But at the end of the day, they're like, Mark was the problem. And like, heavy handed leadership was the problem. They don't see the bigger story, which is that he was symptomatic of issues within evangelicalism. They don't, I think, peel back further and say, hey, why is it that this guy who was actually a total asshole and we all knew it for years grew the biggest church in like America, basically, and was being platformed by the Gospel Coalition, by Together for the Gospel, by all these big mainstream evangelical conferences and stuff for years. The other authors uh, and movements would, you know, endorse his books and back pat yeah. him, knowing Mark what an asshole he was. The problem. He's a symptom of the problem. So yeah. going going after Mark as some type of, you know, sac a sacrificial lamb is probably not the way to solve this. Yeah. And, you know, I thought it was a good podcast, but I think I would say like, you're not, you're not going far enough um, is okay. what I would say about the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast. To so those so who have listened to it. And enjoyed... What does that mean? Heavy handed in. Oh, he would, he would explode at his staff and just curse them out when they would like mess up on things just in front of people. He would shame people. Like he would literally just say, you fucking idiot, like stuff like that to people, like in a staff meeting in front of other people, just an absolute jerk. And everybody knew it for years. This was like, people talked about it behind the scenes. It was like a, like a kind of an open secret type of a thing. Wait, how, um, wait, how did the person like, wild? how did, did, was there no like oversight or there not was? Really, not within. So he built a system where the, he was the top guy at Mars Hill and his oversight, he had elders overseeing him that were at other churches. He basically said, you guys don't know what it's like to lead something of this size. So the people that should oversee me are other people who lead really big churches. So the oversight that Mark's hand selected for himself was not at his own church. It was other mega church pastors were his oversight um, who didn't, they weren't in the trenches. They just like, I don't know. I guess they did Zoom calls every now and then. I don't now, know how it works. Not, this is actually very common in non-denominational, non-denominational evangelical churches that they will hand pick a couple of people who are their buddies from other churches to be on the oversight committee or what? What do you call it? Not the oversight committee, but yeah, like pastoral the board. Right. Put them the on the board because you have to have that at a church, right? At a nonprofit of any kind. And also you can have your wife on the board. You can have your kids on the board. You can have your son-in-law on the board. Apparently yeah. all of this stuff is like totally legal. So then you really don't have any oversight, any real honest oversight at all. 
-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's no laws about how these things are overseen, you know? Um, but what I do know is that like, um, so Paul Tripp was like a Christian counselor who was one of the people I think on that board. And he came in when they were having this conflict and he advised the team and Mark just ignored all the advice that did come through and he went and did his own thing. But the crazy thing is now like he's still preaching. He just did that thing that like, I, th I feel like when people get canceled, now like you have two options like you disappear and you just be canceled or you just keep going just keep doing your thing and you'll find that there's like a douchey set of people that will just keep following you they don't care they actually like the fact that you were canceled yeah, and totally. so like that's who he's attracting now is like yeah these fucking like libtards or whatever right and yeah. so he's growing another church with those people and so he's kind of pressed into that a little bit i don't really that's i don't know how big that church is place to be on a sunday morning i would think <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's putting out a lot of content now, surprisingly, and it's just, you know, it's great. It gets a lot of traction still after all this, even though he's exposed as this, you know, fraud and evil like person. Um, but all that said, seeing him stitch me was surreal because I used to really like love him at one point in my life. I obviously like went far away from that. And so it was a pleasure to be able to kind of clap back. And I posted today a response to his response on mine. And I put out there that I'd love to debate him. Um, I posted that on his um, on his reel and kind of tagged him. And I'm hoping that his media team gets back to me. I think there's like a 0% chance that that would happen. Um, I don't think it's 0%. I think you have enough of a following that there is well, much higher than chance but I, I think the only reason he wouldn't is because he'd be afraid to frankly well he wouldn't yeah he wouldn't expose himself to that I think he's kind of over it in terms of he just does his own he knows that if he just keeps at his own narrative he'll get the views and the clicks he doesn't need to do that sort of thing you know um but if anybody else Mark Driscoll adjacent would like to debate me about hell that's I'm also open to that I am Your writing a book is about open hell. to debating anyone on hell. well not anybody because <laughs> I feel like there are some like just, I don't know, kids out there like, pick me, I'll go for it. No, like, I mean, I don't know, somebody with a podcast maybe. But yeah, I, I think that, that would be some fun content uh, to to argue about what the Bible says about hell. I actually did. I Did you see this? I talked about it as well. I, I did a debate with an evangelical podcast. A guy reached out to me and said, I think it would be cool to have a conversation. I was like, that's awesome. I'm not going to say the name of his podcast, but we recorded two conversations debating progressive Christianity and hell. And he told me, yeah, they'll come out in like a few weeks. It was crickets. They never came out. So I, I DM'd him and like, hey, what's the date on these? And he just never responded. It's been months. And he's ghosted me. I've, every few weeks, I message him again. I'm like, hey, are these ever coming out? And just ghosted. I, nothing. They're not. He's just pretending it didn't happen. And I didn't record the audio that? myself. Oh, okay. So do you are, is your thought that he's not posting these because he feels like you slaughtered him? Absolutely. That's my thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think well, that he didn't want to take the L publicly. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, maybe that's an arrogant way to go for it, but I don't know how else to read it. Cause he's not maybe, I don't know. I, yeah, it's it. it I'm uh, bummed because I, I felt pretty good about it afterwards and you know, maybe course. he didn't. Of course. Well, this, this conversation about hell could lead to how I've been posting things about hell, yes. but from the perspective of an atheist, because Which, in my construction, we talk a little bit less, I feel like, about my atheism. I think there's more juicy, interesting things in the kind of deconstructed Christianity realm that we're both familiar with. But like I ended, not ended, but I'm currently in more what I would describe as atheism. So I've been posting stuff about hell from a different perspective, and it's been wild on my Yeah, let, let me ask you about this, because I do think, I, I think you're right that... Um, a lot of deconstruction people, personalities, they tend to stay within the umbrella of Christianity because from within Christianity, you might be taken more seriously in these debates. I think atheists, it's like you're afraid you're going to get written off. It's like, oh, what do you, what does your opinion count? Because you're an atheist. And mm -hmm. so I would love to hear you, first of all, say why it's like what you say about spirituality should matter, even if you're an atheist. Actually, let's just start there. Why do you think an atheist is allowed to have opinions about spirituality? I think it's interesting for an atheist to hear an atheist, especially one who grew up in evangelicalism and who like for me, I feel like my background of having been in Christian schools for 16 years, all the way through college, 
um, having been married to a minister, having a father who's a minister and being in the church multiple times a week going, you know, I did a missionary training, all of the things didn't leave and start deconstructing until 24. So for me to have been so deep in all of it and have such intimate knowledge with the scripture and then to deconstruct for, I think it took me about eight years before I would have started calling myself an atheist. I for sure just became a more liberal, liberal Christian. Then I became more of a universalist and got into a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit of Buddhism, things like that. Zen Buddhism, which is really just atheism. But um, when I was a yoga teacher and then I landed where I'm at more now, which is agnostic kind of slash atheist. And I think that the reason it matters is because isn't it kind of fascinating to consider someone who sat in all of it fully for so long and was trained in it and everyone around them was in it. And for that person to walk away over that many years and land somewhere different than your landing, which is a more liberal version of the same thing. I don't mean you, I mean the collective you, you know, like that's interesting, right? Like, what did you see that I'm not seeing? What was not convincing enough to you? What, what was the thing that made you go like, no, it's not even that I don't like how this is done, this Christian thing. I don't think any of it is real. I don't think there's enough evidence for any of it to base your life on. That's interesting. Why is that not interesting? You know, like maybe it's less interesting for Christians if you're an atheist your whole life, like you're raised by agnostic parents and you're an atheist. It's like, well, who cares what you have to say? You don't know anything about what we believe. But I always think it's fascinating, like people who in any like fundamentalist religion, whether it's Islam or, you know, the Amish or whether it's, um, you know, Orthodox Jews, you know, like when they come out of it and go, yeah, I don't believe in the, I don't just not believe in those things. I don't think there's evidence for an afterlife or a God or this or that. Like, I find that fascinating because they were in it and knew it intimately for a long time they know the scriptures they know it you know you can't pretend they don't let me ask you this as an atheist what keeps you from murdering anybody you don't like and raping anybody that you want to have sex with as soon as you see them the same thing that keeps everyone from doing that <laughs> if anyone wanted to do that they would do that people just say the scripture is the reason they don't but no one actually believes that <laughs> scripture wouldn't be enough to keep someone from doing something like that if they actually wanted to i'm sorry there's no serial killer out there who's like i would but you know in genesis it says like well i mean scripture. and obviously we see christian leaders all the time that get exposed for you know some of the most heinous shit too all the time all the time of course and would you like and I don't go immediately, oh, they didn't really believe that. I think it's possible to believe something and act in, in ways that are counter to your beliefs. There might even be an internal turmoil over their, over their actions, you know? Or, there, or you can believe that something is an ideal and then just not measure up to the ideal. Right. But that's the case with someone who's an atheist or a Buddhist or a Hindu or in anything. It's like we all have our ideals and our ethics and our values, and then sometimes we fall short of that, Christians right. included. But atheists, it's the same. Like we have an ideal, which is pretty much shared amongst all religions and atheists and agnostics, which is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you only because we don't want to cause suffering because we don't want other people to cause us suffering. And we just figure if we go out there in the world and try to behave in the ways we would want people to behave to us, that it's going to come back to us in a sense. Like we all want to live in a world where people are thinking that way. Because we don't want to be the brunt of all the awful stuff in the world. So we're like, well, I can't do that then. That's just human nature. That has nothing to do with religion. Would you say that it's possible to come to those values then from various sources, like various paths towards ultimately those same sort of humanistic values? Yeah, come to what path? Well, I mean, you, you summarized it as the golden rule, right? Which is yeah. the same way that Jesus summarize yeah. the yeah. the life that we're supposed to be living um and you know you got there a different way than jesus but yeah. you landed in the same place in terms of how we're meant to yeah. live in this life yeah i love jesus i mean for the record i think as as a teacher and as a um as a rabbi i think the teachings of jesus are phenomenal and i'd be hard pressed to find stuff i disagree with frankly 
Uh, that doesn't mean that I think Jesus was God incarnate. You know, <laughs> I just think Jesus was a really cool character and whether he was real or not, I don't know, but certainly there was a person named Jesus. I don't know, you know, how much of the oral tradition and the written tradition that we now read and interpret as scripture is like super 100% accurate, <laughs> you know? Um, but I definitely love the character of Jesus. Yeah. Do you think, um, it's important for Christians to be around and exposed to atheists or people that don't believe in God in the same way as them? And if so, why? A hundred percent, because this is my thing. If you can't be around people who disagree with you, there is something about the things you believe that doesn't feel strong enough inside of you. You know, if you really believe what you believe is true, then you can rest in that. And it doesn't feel scary to have other people believe different things in your presence or even to ask you questions and challenge what you believe because you're like it's okay like I believe this I'm so solid in this like I do feel a lot of American evangelical Christians evangelical Christians have a very fragile faith that even being in the presence of someone who doesn't believe deeply challenges their spirits and they don't like it they don't like the way it feels like just having someone not believe in God can be enough of a challenge, but let alone if you're like, hey, listen, can I ask you some questions about your Christianity and why you believe what you believe? As soon as they feel like they don't have a logical, solid, good answer for the questions an atheist is asking, nine times out of 10, that person turns angry and becomes, um, it, it begins to assassinate your character, essentially. It, 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 it's like you lose ground as soon as you start asking really tough questions. And I think that's fragile faith, no matter if you're a Christian or anyone, you should be able to answer. And I actually think a super valid answer is I, I don't have a clue. Right. I don't have a clue. That's, I have not, that's not something evangelicals are trained to do. I, they're trained to always have an answer, you know? Yes. And I think in general, in the West, we, you know, kind of an enlightenment thinking, very rationalistic. We think that there needs to be an answer for everything. We There's think not. That it's to hold together. Um, even like the way that we think about like the idea of like Jesus dying for our sins, right? Like that's kind of a fundamental or a central idea in Christianity. It's like what sal where salvation is found is for most Christians or for many Christians, it's in the cross and like in what Jesus did on the cross and dying for their sins. And they often think about it in like a formulaic transaction. And then that kind of the, the, like the payment metaphor, which is like, there's a handful of verses that kind of allude to Jesus's death as like a payment for sins, which is, is a metaphor. And there's actually other metaphors that are used for what happens on the cross. Cause when you're encountering like a dramatic spiritual thing, like that happens in history, you talk about it in different ways and use different metaphors to describe it. And one of the ways that you might use to describe it is like, man, it's like, it's like Jesus was paying for, for the sins of others. Cause like, obviously he didn't die for his own sins. He was, you know, he was an innocent victim. Um, and so you grab these different metaphors, but what tends to happen is those, they turn it into like a formula of like some sort of a metaphysical like thing that actually happens. And we have to actually figure out, no, 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 like there's a debt here and now there's a ledger and like <laughs> G the sins were on you, like on a ledger. And then they go on that to- That we like, turn we it into to a code that we have exactly. to like and replicate, you know? Like something actually happened in like- the spiritual, and then they want to figure out, and then they say that's salvation is not just like described in a metaphorical way. Like, oh, one of the ways we'll talk about salvation, it's almost like our sins were paid for. No, 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 no. That is the essence of it. And it's accepting this formula. And now in order to be a real Christian, for some people, you have to believe that the formula happens that exact way. Like for a lot of Christians, if you don't embrace penal substitutionary atonement, if you don't believe that the formula goes down like this in the metaphysical realm, something that nobody can see, it's like this vague vague nebulous concept, but you have to believe in it with this utmost literalness that the formula is actually this real thing that happens that your sin debt is removed. If you don't believe it just like that, you're going to hell. It's yeah, all black missing, and white. You're missing it if you don't believe in that. I had one so black and fabulous white. girl comment on a reel that I posted this week. And she said, I am a Christian. I consider myself a Christian. I love my relationship with God and you know my church family or however she said it. And she said, and the questions you're asking are questions I ask myself all the time, and I don't have good answers for them. And I wrote her back, you're amazing, because out of hundreds of hate comments that I've gotten over the last few reels that I've posted, you are one of like 
three people who has gotten on here and said good questions without being threatened by saying that. Like, if I admit that I have these questions too, that means my faith isn't solid and maybe I'm going to hell. Or if I say to her, yeah, great question. I don't know the answer to that, that that somehow makes me not a good Christian. And like, why can we not just say, I don't know. And some Christians will act like the, do this gotcha thing with me where they're like, well, if none of this is real, then how did we get here? And I'm like, great question. That's a different conversation. Great question. I don't know how we got here. Where did we come from? Well, everybody's asking that question. That's a great question. I don't have the answer of where we came from. I'm just saying your answer isn't it for me because I don't think you have enough evidence. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying, and therefore here's the answer. And I have the secret code to that answer. I'm just saying I'm more open to the fact of not knowing than you are. You must act as though you know with certainty what is going to happen in the afterlife. I don't need that for myself. I don't need to know, pretend that I know that. That agnosticism is attractive to me. And not only that, I think it's really important to like get to the point where you can live with that because all of us actually, nobody actually knows where oh. everything <laughs> came from or yes. what happens when we die. Nobody That's correct. No one knows. I think it's and, really honest to say, none of us know. I'm just saying, I'm admitting that I don't. Yeah, I, I will say, I think there's different labels that we can put on different things. And um, like you're, so here's, here, here's a curiosity. So I would say, I mean, that whole idea of not knowing is more agnostic. There's a stereotype with atheists that they're like a militant atheist where they're trying to convince everybody that nobody should believe in God. Would you say that it's important for you to convince other people that there's no God? Or would, yeah, like, how would you describe the way? That no, I don't care about that at all. I'm completely uninterested in convincing. In, in that case, what do you care about? Like, what would you say if you could, like, convince people as an atheist who is speaking out of, you know, the void into people and you're like, what would you hope to convince people of? I want people to ask better questions and I want people to learn how to think better. I think that I feel robbed of a proper education being raised in the Christian schools that I was raised in and the environment I was in, not learning evolution, not learning history taught correctly, um, not learning science in the way that science should be taught such that I was in my twenties and, and, you know, out of school and didn't actually understand all of those things. I didn't know how to reason properly. I didn't understand the scientific method. I didn't know how to debate my beliefs with someone and not get totally worked up and start crying because <laughs> I didn't know the answers. I didn't know any of that. And I, I feel very passionate now as an almost 42 year old mom who does consider myself an atheist and who was raised in the church. I feel very passionate now that people figure out what it took me too long to figure out, which is to be skeptical like you say, to be curious, to ask better questions, to be comfortable with not knowing, which to me is a, a level of just humility. And I think there's a lot of beauty and wonder that comes in that. I don't find that to be a terrifying dead end, not knowing. I think it's gorgeous and, and really awe-inspiring to go, I don't know the answer to that, but like, why do I assume that I would or anyone would, honestly? Yeah. And and that's hard to sit with, but I, I find a lot of peace in it. Well, even as a Christian, I can get on board with everything that you just said as an atheist. So th those things don't scare me. And I think that if those, like, if that scares you, then I think that, I, I do think that most American Christians have a manufactured certainty in their faith where they think that they have to be certain and they're not allowed to question those things. And to, to question them um, is to admit that you don't really know or don't really have faith, which potentially means you're not a real believer, which potentially means you're going to hell. Which and so that's, <laughs> yeah, that's scary. scary. That's scary. And so you have to know. And that is one reason why um, it is a really wonderful, liberating thing to whatever faith or not faith you espouse to not believe in ultimate punishment. Um, because I, I think the idea of like, unless you have it all figured out, unless you have all the right answers about these spiritual metaphysical claims, you're going to burn forever. That doesn't really give you the permission to explore, be curious, be honest intellectually at all. Like, 
if you believe in hell, mm -hmm. you are not going to be spiritually curious. You can't afford to. I really don't think you can. No, you uh, can't. You I think that you are, but like there's a limit to that spiritual exploration, especially if you think that going to hell is connected to having certain like believing a specific thing about about jesus yeah. or what what jesus did on the cross things that we don't know that are actually ambiguous even in the bible that yeah. different theological streams have come up to with different answers to and yet we were raised in an evangelicalism that had these only like one answer uh, about these things you know yeah so I, I, one thing that i do love to say to people too around atheism is like because i think this is the closest i've ever gotten someone described it to me like this helping people Christian, helping Christians specifically understand atheism in a softer way. We're all atheists. All of us are atheists in some way. There are certain things we there, like a Christian is a great example. Christians are almost atheists. They don't believe in any God or goddess except the one. So they're rejecting. So the nature of a Christian's atheist is that they are rejecting the existence of any other God, all the thousands of gods that are out there only believing in their God, I just say to them, I do the same thing plus one more. Well, I reject one more God than you do. Did, did you know, this is interesting based on what you just said, did you know that in the Roman world, when Christians in the early church were persecuted, they were called atheists by the, the Romans because they rejected their pantheon of gods? The Correct. Christians did not believe in all of their gods. They said those gods are no gods at all. And Which so they an were persecuted and called, and called atheists. Yeah, uh, correct. So it's true. It, that, that, is a, that is a good point. I um, I mean, I, I, I would probably be like a panentheist when it comes to my Christian belief in God and that I do believe that even though I believe in one God, I believe that God infuses all of reality um, yes. and that God is everywhere and, and, and a part of all things. Um, and so... I, I think the opposite in that it's kind of all God, baby. <laughs> um, say, it's not everybody's not an atheist. Someone like you actually really isn't. And universalists really aren't. Many religions actually aren't because they believe what you say as well, which is this idea of God being in everything and all of us being part of God. But I guess, I guess it's more true that an evangelical Christian is very close to an atheist. Right, to me. right, right. When you're very exclusivistic and you reject everybody else's way. Yeah, and and, but then they're, they're looking at me right. and they're like, how could how could you reject the one true God? And I'm looking at them like the same way you've rejected tens of thousands of them. It's actually not it's hard like, at all. Like, do you believe in Vishnu? Oh, no, I'm just like that. Yeah, I get it. It's not a thing for you? Okay. <laughs> all right. I want to transition. There's been a lovely little conversation about atheism. And wow. I love I love your little project. I love what you're doing. I think that more Christians should be less judgmental of atheists. I think it's a valid spiritual pathway. Um, and I think there's a good reason for for getting there intellectually. I would love it. And and I also love that we do this together from, from these different perspectives, you know, and that we actually have a lot of unity. I found that like, I have a lot of unity with people that share similar values and you can get to those values in, in different ways and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but we love to answer listener letters on this show. And yeah. so if you have a, a question or a sort of a life situation that you'd love to get feedback on from Meg and I, you can shoot an email to sacredcouncilpod at gmail.com. I'm going to read a listener letter that actually came to me through an Instagram DM and we will respond to it. Hey, Brian, firstly, thanks for your voice and your platform. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've turned to it. I saw your recent post about weddings and felt compelled to send a message about my situation. I was talking about gay weddings. Uh, sorry if this is a little long, but here goes. Uh, I am engaged to my amazing partner and going to be married this September. I have one sister and we essentially grew up attached at the hip. We were best friends. My sister and her husband are evangelicals. My sister came to this religion through him. She got married at 20, almost 15 years ago. My sister and my partner became, oh, so her, her lesbian partner and her sister became close friends because they're both in the video film industry. And my partner would often help her with work, give her advice, et cetera. I've always been there for my sister, supporting her in all of her life stages and events, even at times when her husband was not, i.e. ensuring her birthdays were special because her husband often didn't do anything for her. It was never totally normal with them. Example, we never talked openly about anything of substance, but overall our dynamic was respectful and my sister, not so much her husband, treated us well. However, since our engagement, they've treated us differently, horribly. They sabotaged an engagement party for us this summer with my family and straight up told us they aren't coming to our wedding. 
Not only that, they told us in a lengthy email, it was a sacrifice to have my partner and myself sleep in their home because we were lesbians. They also said over and over again, we do not feel homosexuality is good and that they're teaching their children it's wrong to be gay amongst many other hurtful things. They say it's all in the name of God. This has obviously been tremendously painful. They now say we, as in my partner and I, are discriminating against them for being Christians because I've suggested that maybe Jesus does love us the way we are and that maybe they should too. They said we should be grateful they allow us around, they allowed us around their children. My sister has said if I can accept her beliefs, she would sit through the wedding, which doesn't feel right. I only want her there if she actually is happy for me. I've even said, believe whatever you want, but just treat me with kindness and like an equal, which has not happened. We haven't talked in a couple months, and the other day she messaged me again to talk, which is usually her trying to explain why they are, why what they are doing is actually loving, to which I say, this doesn't feel like love, and she says, I don't support her religious beliefs. It's mental gymnastics. Yes. My partner and I have been engaged for a year. We're getting married in less than six months. I'm tired of debating my worth and explaining to her what real love is. Mm -hmm. But I also worry that if I cut off communication completely, she'll have no one in her life who isn't inside her evangelical bubble. But I honestly cannot keep taking this from her. I apologize for this being so long. I'm curious if you have any advice. Is there anything I could say to her? Or do you feel it's a complete loss? Yeah. <sighs> I, I wrote this and then I just changed a few details so you wouldn't know it was me. <laughs> this does mirror your story quite a bit. I mean, I'm yeah. sorry, but the whole time I'm like, ooh, trigger warning, trigger yeah. warning. And so what I imagine is if this is you, if this is her, this is a lot of people right now. That's right. It is a lot of people. And there are two ways you can handle this. As far as I can tell. One, you accept that they are never going to change. Yeah. Ever. And then if they do change ever, what a surprise, <laughs> but you don't keep the hope alive that you're going to be the one that's going to change them. And the reason you don't is because hope deferred makes the heart grow sick at sick, as the scripture says, Amen, and, you will, sister. <laughs> and you will feel real crappy about that over time, constantly hoping you're going to get a different result than what you likely are going to keep getting. Okay. Sounds like arguing with reality. Arguing with reality, as our beloved Byron Katie likes to say, it will make you feel insane because it is insane to argue with reality. Reality is that you have a family who, frankly, is bigoted, does not understand true love, and they will make it seem as though it's your problem. You're the one not being loving. You're the one not being accepting. And we all know, all of us, all of us who are intellectually honest, that that's not what's actually happening here. However, good luck convincing them. So you stay in it, you let go of outcomes, you let them be who they are, and you accept that they're going to call the shots on the family dynamic. Like they're going to get to decide you get to be around the kids or if they're going to come to the wedding or not. And you just can't let any of it mean anything to you that's going to make you feel awful. That's yeah, you it. You just literally have to go into it assuming it's going to be absolutely awful so that you're not disappointed because it is, in fact, absolutely awful because they are who they are. Correct. So like maybe they don't show up to the wedding and you and your partner go, we're inviting them. We're acting like, why wouldn't they be there? They come or they don't come, but we just sort of expect that maybe they won't and it's not going to affect our day. Well, also good luck doing that because you're a human being. And it's like, even in me saying that, I know there are some people who are able to navigate that on some level, but oftentimes they will tell you how challenging it is within their own heart to be split like that all the time, to be in a way, holding back certain parts of themselves and in a way, having another group of people dictate what's allowed and isn't allowed in the family dynamic, that feels awful. So you can do that or you can say to them, if you can treat me with equality in this way, this way, in this way, we can have relationship. And if not, we won't. And that is a really hard path to travel, but yeah. that is the other option. What is not an option is what 99.9% .9 of us try to do. My therapist tells me this is not an option. This comes from an actual therapist, that it should be <laughs> an option for us to think that we're going to be in it and try to change them. Yeah. That should not be an option for us because it is not our responsibility to change other people ever. Right. And that's really where she goes with this is she lands by saying like, is there anything I could say to her? You know, like that's what we want. Yeah. And listen, I want to just affirm 
that it is so beautiful to me that you have been hurt so badly by these people. And yet you still are showing up, not just like, how do I feel better? That's not your, your concern. Isn't like, I've been so hurt. How do I feel better? Your concern is like, it's like, you want to save her, you know? And it, her concern is how do I help her feel mm -hmm, better? Mm -hmm. How do I help my sister feel better? Which is so loving and yeah. compassionate. Like you're the loving one here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Truly. And I, 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 yeah, I agree with, with, with what Meg just said. I think that that those are your two options is like to keep the relationship with zero expectations at them being anything close to what you want them to be, but just maintaining their presence in your lives simply because they're family and because, Hey, you know what? I, as a faith filled believer in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, believe that actually resurrection can happen and miracles do happen. And that when like, like relationships feel like they're in the tomb, they might like rise up and walk. And I, I think it's possible, but not because you are going to say the right thing to do it. Not I think because you argue them into it, right? It'll only be because you love them into it. Yeah. And ultimately like uh, some love has to get a hold of their hearts. And it might be something you say, but honestly, it will probably be a complex combination of a million things that could change their minds or their minds may never change. Right. right? But I will one, two, two things I'll say to add to what Meg said. First of all, your best bet, if you are going to shift them at all, I have noticed in my relationships, my best bet is people. So change is so complicated. Changing somebody's mind, almost impossible. Yeah. But your best bet at changing somebody's mind, people change when they feel understood. And I find that when I lean in with curiosity and ask questions and have a posture, not of I'm trying to change you and you need to come to where I'm at. But when my posture is I'm trying to better understand you and where you're coming from, when people feel heard and understood in that way, they're more likely to open up and come towards where you're at. That is incredibly counterintuitive because you want so badly to change where they're at but they're more likely to change when you're actually leaning into curiosity. That's really hard. And here's the thing that you don't have to do that because that is emotional labor. That What I just described is emotional labor. I'm not guilt tripping you and saying you should be more curious. I'm saying that that's maybe your best bet to change him, but you've expressed in this letter, I don't think I can do this anymore. Well, and I that's okay to too. A little asterisk here too, is that for people who identify as queer, they spend their whole lives feeling very gaslit around their sexuality just because of the culture that we live yeah. in, which is heteronormative. So when you come out, coming out in and of itself is a burden. Nobody else, people who are straight don't come out. It's just the default expectation. But when you're gay, you have to come out, which is already a huge amount of emotional labor. And coming out, like this idea that we come out of the closet once and that was the coming out is ridiculous. If you're gay, you come out all the time, over and over and over. You come out every day when people go, oh, wait, oh, that's your girlfriend? Oh, okay, how do you identify? Oh, how like coming out is a process that happens almost daily for queer people. So we're already living with a huge amount of emotional labor and responsibility around our identity and sexuality to then take on helping lean in curiously to the people close to us who are treating us like shit so that that maybe possibly they become kinder to us is literally epic behavior that I bow to. And I love what you're saying. And you don't have to do it. It's asking <laughs> but, a lot. Yeah, it's but some not, it could be a stretch for you mentally, depending and emotionally, depending on where you're at with your healing process too. And I think what I would add is that you can, you're allowed to present, you're allowed to do this sometimes and not do it other times. It doesn't always have to be a one answer where it's like, well, yeah. I'm cutting her off forever. You might say, I, I can't do this right now. I need six months away from this. And then you might have the energy to re-engage. And that's okay too. And you can just communicate that. And if she struggles with it and it's like, oh, da, 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 like that's her, that's your eyes are on your paper <laughs> and right. Like you, you control how you show up and you set your boundaries with her. You communicate clearly and graciously when you can. But if you need to shut that door for a while, you're allowed to shut that door for a while. I think if you show up, try to show up with curiosity. But I just understand how much that's asking. I don't have to do that. And so the last thing that I would want to do as a straight white man is to say, just be more curious about this judgmental person. Like, that's what you should be doing. Duh. No, this no, but is Brian, what you're saying is like fundamentally very true in every situation, no matter how you know, challenging it might be. It's just also we should put the asterisk in of like recognizing we both know what that's asking yeah. of someone, you totally. know? Yeah. I, 
my three, like when I, if I'm engaging in a conversation with somebody where I think there's a disagreement and I'm trying to potentially change their minds or set boundaries or whatever, I, yeah. being kind, being clear and being curious has really served me well. I'm yeah. trying to, whatever I say, I'm going to try to say it as graciously as possible. I try to be really clear because I protect my peace. And then like, if I can lean in and ask questions to show that I'm interested in their perspective, I try to be curious as well. But when somebody hates your fundamental identity, you might not be able to show up with kindness, clarity, and curiosity. And if so, maybe don't show up at all. Yeah, because it's different than arguing around what's the best grocery store to shop at or where should we go to dinner or do we believe it's even very different than do we believe in pro-choice pro choice or pro-life? Like there, there's, do you know what I mean? Like It's, it's your also- identity. It's your life. It's your relationship. It's your most beloved. It's your beloved partner. You're getting married. This is your it's whole life. Who you are. It's like in the fabric of your DNA and in the fabric of the DNA of the person that you're getting ready to, to marry. Like this is so different than like helping them understand almost anything else, frankly, you know? I'm so sorry you're going through this, friends. I think that so many people are. And I, I think... Um, So maybe this bit of like compassion and curiosity will help. I feel sorry for your sister and your family as well that carry these judgmental beliefs because I do, I fundamentally believe that, um, and this isn't true for everybody. Some people really are just evil at the very core. I doubt your sister is evil at the very core. You you described her in some ways that made her sound like a good person in, in some ways, but she has a belief that is shutting down her ability to be loving in this in this way and in this relationship, which really sucks for her. It's it's her loss that she's going to lose out on the ability to love your beautiful relationship. And so I feel a lot of grief and pity for the parents, for like the conservative parents of like gay kids and they don't go to their own kids' weddings. For the most part, those parents um, are in a place where I have compassion for them because I know that they're believing beliefs. It's bigger than them, in other words. It's not just like they decided being gay is evil. They're a part of a whole system that indoctrinated them. And now they think that in order to be faithful to God, in order to be faithful to the Bible and to Jesus, they have to believe these judgmental things. And that sucks for them. I feel really fucking bad for them. And that's why, and I think hell is at the center of it too, because like, yep, it's one thing, it's like, oh, they're making a little boo-boo. No, 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 they think you're going to hell. So like- in that way, like hell can misshape love where to love you, what's more loving than keeping somebody out of hell, right? And so if it means that I have to not go to your wedding or something like that in order to achieve this greater goal, then they'll do that. And right, so because that, your parents not uh, attending your wedding is the thing that's going to keep you from going to hell. Yeah, I'm, obviously, I mean, it doesn't I'm actually sure that, work I'm out. sure that's really going to affect all those gay couples and make them go, you know what? I think we should become Christians. Our parents didn't show up to the wedding. Yeah, that's they think, making me think well, twice. They're also about being it. told by their pastors that if they do that, they're endorsing sin. God is grieved, and they're so they're so worried about that. And it makes me it makes me really sad because it's sad how like in the name of love, like they they're thinking they're doing a loving thing and they're actually doing a hateful thing. And that's how you know bad theology. <laughs> bad yeah. theology um, makes loving people do hateful things. Makes loving people do hateful things. Yep, there it is. Well, on that happy note, this has been a great, no, <laughs> no, I hope, Hey, listen, I, I want to say to you, lastly, letter writer, um, we're in your corner. You're not alone. So many people going through this and you're brave for yes. moving forward and all the best to you. Um, we love you. Yeah. And I'm going to add in, find a way to celebrate the gift of your queerness. When you feel under attack for who you are, sometimes the best thing you can do is move in the opposite spirit of that thing. So find a way to celebrate the gift of your queerness um, and with people who affirm that. Awesome. Well, Meg, any closing thoughts? This has been another enlightening uh, convo here. Love what you're up to too. Oh my gosh. I feel like this is a really fun two intro episodes to get us back. What do you say? Should we keep doing this? Let's keep doing it. Let's Let's fucking go. Let's go. Let's go. (laughs) All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.